Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's episode number 84 of the Audible Farm podcast, and this episode is brought to you by Couch Town Coffee. You know them, you love them. It's it's the best coffee in Iowa, hands down. It's roasted to order, made exactly for you to your specifications. Go to couchtowncoffee.com, find a coffee you like, make an order, and when you make an order, you can save 20% by entering the code word ROOTS. The code word is ROOTS. That's the code word this week. It'll save you 20%. It lets them know that Audible Farm uh, got you in touch with them, and you can save yourself 20% on, on your whole entire order. So go there, make an order. Check them out on Facebook, uh, Couchtown Coffee on Facebook. This is my favorite coffee. It's made to order. Like I said, enter that code word ROOTS. You'll save 20%. Why? Because Couchtown Coffee is awesome. Why is the code word ROOTS this week? Well, this week I'm sitting down and I'm talking with Matt Woods. Matt Woods, I've known about Matt for a long time just from the internet. Matt's from Iowa. He plays guitar. He uh, he, he has been known as Matt Woods blues music for a while, but now it's Matt Woods roots music, and I think that fits pretty darn good. Uh, he, he's got both styles covered very well. He's a very good guitarist. I, I like watching him play online um, on Facebook. He just goes live sometimes and plays some stuff just dinking around solo, and it's tons of fun to watch him play. Uh, it's a great way for me to sit down while I open up Facebook and scroll through, and that's one of them that I almost always watch, is watch Matt, Matt Woods uh, just jam around on, on guitar. It's tons of fun. I hope I can see him live someday, because I've never actually seen him live, but uh, you got to you gotta just trust me on this. Amazing guitarist, tons of fun. He uh, plays slide, acoustic, dobro, the whole blues, I mean, everything. We talk about his album, uh, Tired and Dirty, that is available on streaming services, as well as uh, a litany of other things in this podcast. Uh, We kind of just got to know each other. I didn't know him. I'd never met him before. Uh, I waited a long time to interview him, and I got to admit, I was pretty nervous to interview him. So uh, I hope I did it justice. Matt was a great guest. I got to say thanks first and foremost before I even get to the episode to Matt. Thanks, Matt. I really appreciate it. Uh, Uh, Thanks for taking time out of your day to sit down and talk with me. And here we go, everybody. I hope you enjoy this one as much as I did. It's episode number 84 with Matt Woods. It's the Audible Farm Podcast with your host, Peter Stockdale. Yeah, I can edit anything you want. So if you say something you don't want to, just let me know. I'll, I'll edit it out. Oh, you should leave it in. That's the only way I can learn my lesson. <laughs> All righty. Well, let's uh, start it up here somewhere. Uh, today, I am sitting down with Matt Woods. Uh, Matt, I first found you on Facebook. You were, um, at the time, it was Matt Woods uh, Blues Music, I believe is what it was. Does that sound right? Yeah, and yep. now and now recently you changed it to Matt Woods Roots music. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I was gonna I was looking for you the other day on Facebook, and I'm like, uh, I think I think this is him, you know, and and it and it is. And I actually, I kind of dig the fact that you call it Roots music because after listening to the album that's available for streaming, I it totally fits the Roots moniker as opposed to uh, maybe just pigeonholing it as blues. Yeah, that was that was kind of my thought. I, I didn't want to. I mean, I, that's I'm, what I'm playing is roots music, so I should call it that. And I, I feel like it was, you know, I was maybe pigeonholing myself. And then, unfortunately, with the way the way things work, is it seems like when somebody hears the word blues, if they're not really into it, it's immediately a turn off, you know. And uh, that's that's been my experience. So I think I think people are kind of used to and conditioned to hearing mediocre to bad. Uh, blues bands and so um you know just kind of has a a negative connotation right off the bat for a lot of people so you know just i don't know i'm trying to find i'm trying to find my my spot in all this just like everybody else you know trying to find my little my little niche or whatever so well it totally makes sense i mean um when i first saw the change uh on facebook i was like "I, i i wonder why and then when i started listening to the album that is available for streaming uh tired and dirty is the name of the album if anyone's looking for it um stream it buy it love it it's front i was talking to him before the podcast front to back it the album flows really really well start to finish and it does have a lot of a a roots feel uh as opposed to just a uh basic kind of a you know 12 bar blues kind of thing going on Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, well, thank you. How, how did you get introduced to the guitar originally? Did you start like as a youngster? Did you pick it up as an adult? Uh, well, I guess somewhere in between. Uh, I, I got my first guitar. I was 20 years old. So I wouldn't call that quite an adult, uh, but so I was. I, but definitely later, later in life, I think than than a lot of people. Um, it was just kind of something I always wanted to do, and uh, finally got sort of an opportunity or the will to do it uh, when I was in college, and uh, picked it up then. So, did you? Was it like the first time it was affordable for you, or did you have like a buddy that was playing, or did you go see somebody yeah. live, or some some of all that? Actually, what happened was I was. I was Growing up, my my whole life, I was an athlete. Like I was a baseball player. That was my thing, all through, you know, from from time I was five years old, and I played played my whole life. I was a baseball player in college, and uh, finally my my senior year, things weren't things weren't working out, and so I ended up stopping that, and I kind of had this void um, void to fill. I mean, like I said, that kind of been my whole life uh, up to that point, and so. Like I said, I always wanted to. I always wanted to play. I always wanted to try it, and so I just figured that would be a good time to do it. And I, for whatever reason, you know, if I'm trying to fill that void, uh, literally in my schedule or emotionally or whatever, you know, we're all kind of running from something. So uh, I was able to. I think it was a pretty critical point in my life for me to pick it up, and I just was able to dive in. And fortunately, that time in my life, and for several years after that, I was able to play. 12 hours a day and just learn, you know, I, I didn't have commitments really or responsibilities. And so I was really able to uh, focus on that. That's, that's really cool. You know, I, I, I dig what you're saying there with, uh, I dig, no, I dig what you're saying there with, uh, um, having like that void, you know, uh, when you're growing up, uh, you're, you're doing the sports thing, you're playing games, you're traveling, you said you're on a college team, so you're definitely traveling, you're working out, you're doing practices, uh, I mean, there's a lot of time that gets soaked up into all that kind of stuff. And when that goes away, you're left with this giant hunk of of something. Um, I mean, lately, a lot of people have felt that with the coronavirus thing yeah. going on. I mean, not just uh, not just the average human. I mean, it's it's almost all the jobs across uh, across the board are getting shut down in some fashion or another. So people are probably having that same feeling that you're describing right now. It's it's almost like a. a a void of self-purpose or something kind of like that would be the way I would describe yeah. it. Yeah, definitely. I, hopefully people are picking up guitars, you know, and taking the opportunity to, to learn, even if it's not music, learn something new that they've always wanted to try and, and whatever. So, yeah, this is prime time to pick up a new hobby and find something new. I mean, it's, it's crazy cr- cruising through Facebook. You don't, you don't, it's not only just the musicians out there doing stuff uh, that you get to see, but you get to see, see some of your friends. Like I made bread for the first time and it's like, that is awesome. You know, <laughs> yeah. right. speaking of, yeah, you never know where, where it might take you. You know, I didn't, I didn't think that when I picked up, picked up a guitar i just kind of wanted to learn and it's ended up taking me some pretty pretty interesting places and and gotten to, i've gotten to meet and become friends with some of my heroes and it's been it was a major life-changing thing for me kind of set me on a whole new whole new path so yeah just never know when something like that's gonna strike i guess yeah so uh strike while the iron's hot you know it's uh it's prime time to do something new and, and speaking of people going online and, and showing off what they are doing with their free time uh You've you've been at like the forefront of this. It seems like every time I open up my Facebook, there's a feed from you going live, talking about <laughs> something or doing a playthrough or just jamming the morning away. Yeah, good. It's yeah. working. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> the, I'm to- al- the algorithm I'm- is working. <laughs> no, I'm totally seeing it. It's perfect. It's it's great to to spend you know five ten minutes watching you do something, and you're even like. I made a, I made a post about it. I was like, man, he's giving away all the secrets here. You know, you were showing people how to do slide guitar and things like that. And it's, uh, it's, it's fun. Is that something that like, do you give lessons or is that just something you're kind of doing to fill up your time or? Yeah, I, I give lessons. Um, I've kind of, uh, I have kind of had a policy of for most of my career is I'll tell any, anybody, anything they want to know, you know, anytime. So mm-hmm. uh, I get anybody that's interested I'll get together with and and tell them what I know. So and I usually don't charge any. I don't charge anything for it. So it's kind of a community service type deal for me. I, there's been I don't know. There's a whole. There's so many people that have sort of done that for me in my sort of journey as a musician or life as a musician. That it kind of seems like that's about the least I can do for anybody. That especially if I think that person is really serious about. I tend to. 
I'm not the guy that's going to teach you how to play Sweet Child of Mine or something like that. You know, as a as if you're a beginning guitar player, teach you how to strum some chords. I I try to focus more towards people that are trying to find their own path with the instrument and want to make it a serious part of their life. And if I, you know, can tell that you're serious about it, I'll tell you anything. Well, the- anything, that, anything that I know, which may or may not be very much, but <laughs> to me, it seems like there's, you know, and I've had a lot of conversations with people on both ends, either teaching or learning. And sometimes you just need just one sentence that somebody says makes you think about something from maybe a different angle or a different perspective that you've never thought of before. And that can open up a whole new set of doors musically. Like, Oh, I just never thought of it that way. Now that you say it that way, it makes total sense, you know, or whatever. So any, yeah, I mean, that's, um, I, that's why I, lo- I love talking about this stuff. I and mean, people, it seems like people rarely ask. So I apologize. You know, some, you're going to ask me something and I'm just going to babble on because you know, I so rarely get to talk about it that I'll just, I just spill my guts. Let's, let's do it though. I mean, like, uh, that makes my job easier, but at the, <laughs> at the same time, like I, I want to hear about this stuff cause it makes sense. Like I'm, a, I would call myself a novice guitarist, I guess I played through my uh, late teens. I didn't play much through my twenties. I kind of picked it up again in my late, late twenties and was like, I want to figure out what this is kind of all about. Mm-hmm. And, uh, as far as like learning scales and how to apply them, you can watch YouTube videos for days and not figure anything out until you watch the one that the guy, exactly like you said, the guy says exactly what you needed to hear in, in like one sentence. And you're like, oh, I get it. You know? Yeah, how, exactly. Yeah. How, so, you know, yeah, just if you pay attention, I mean, I tell people that I work with or that I teach quote unquote teach. It's like the number one thing I tell people is just pay attention. If you make it, if you make it a priority in your life, First of all, the first step, you'd be surprised just what that would do for you. And then after that, to fine tune it, you just really pay attention. If you listen to someone talk about it or you listen to records or whatever, listen and focus and really pay attention to what, you know, what somebody's playing or whatever and things will things will click, you know? That's that's just it seems like that's the hard part. And I know people aren't some people are better suited for that than others and maybe I'm the kind of person that can really, you know, laser focus on some of this stuff. But that's really all there is to it. When I started out, I didn't have – there was no YouTube or anything like that. I went to shows and I saw saw people played and I ran home and or I listened to records and I would run home and uh, try to make those sounds. And it, that's simple, you know, as simple as that. And then obviously over time, you learn a little bit more, a little bit more, one brick at a time and then you've got a house, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way of saying it because like – when I first started learning stuff, uh, it's like, okay, I know how a scale applies to something. And then you just literally just follow the scale up the do, re, mi, you know, it's like all the way up and all the way back down. You're like, I'm jamming to some backing track and you're really not doing much until you start to kind of figure out where you can go with some of the notes and bend them a little bit and things like that and skip around with them. And, and I think that's one of the funnest things. Cause like once you learn one little lick, you can throw in there and then you learn another one and then you stack them together. You're like, Oh, that's really cool. You know? Uh, before you know it, like you said, your whole your whole toolbox is full of all these tools that you can use to complete the job in any way you want to, and and it's 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 beautiful how it works out like that. It seems like a, such a daunting task starting from the beginning, but it's crazy how fast that, like you said, that toolbox will fill up if you're just kind of paying attention to what other people are doing and and always trying to like emulate other people's styles and kind of I like what he did there. I'm gonna try and do that and then kind of make it your own in some way. Yeah, for sure. And it is a daunting task. I mean, nobody said it's nobody ever said it was going to be easy, you know, and it's like uh, I kind of try to make people understand that are frustrated because I get frustrated, too. Don't get me wrong. But it's like you have to look at it in the long the long view. Like it takes 500 years to get good at it. You know what I mean? I mean, you you can dedicate your entire life to it and you'll never be satisfied. You know, there's. Yeah think of the world's greatest musicians, they could die at 90 years old and not be satisfied with what they're doing. Like that's, you can kind of need to go into it, understanding that this is just something that you make a, uh, you know, you dedicate yourself to and you sort of make a decision that this is what I'm going to apply my time and my energy to for the rest of my life. And that's, that's it. I mean, I just sort of made that decision, you know what I mean? And Mm -hmm. you stick to it as long as you can. And hopefully it takes you the rest of your life, you know, if if you're lucky, you know, you stick with it. Yeah, I mean, what? Let me let me ask you this: What drives you to keep doing this day after day after day? I mean, me as somebody like in my twenties, I just kind of faltered off and quit playing. Like, what what makes you keep going? You know, instead of just kind of 
do you always have like a guitar sitting out there like ready to play is it uh... yeah pretty much yeah see my in life life tends to change you know we all we're all in different phases of life like i've got a young family now and and uh, i certainly don't get to practice as much as i want to but i i made a decision many years ago to where i kind of ditched all my other hob- hobbies and i decided that if i have 10 minutes of free time this is what i'm going to do if i have an hour of free time this is what i'm going to focus on you know or, or whatever it is so um to me you know maybe i do have a little bit of obsessive personality about that and that's kind of served me well but i just and i'm maybe i'm lucky to this point i've been playing for 20 years now it's like i have not lost the interest you know there's been there's been periods where i i kind of want to put it down for a few days or even a week or whatever and i've I've never gone that long i guess but you know my point is i kind of get you get burnt out or whatever but i've never really lost the deep burning desire to learn to learn more and to learn how to better express myself on my instrument and if i think about the root thing honestly (laughs) i'll be brutally honest with you here uh it probably has a lot to do with some really deep rooted insecurities that I have or, you know, whatever. Like I said, we're all running from something, man. And it's like my, I just want to be, I want the respect of the people that I look up to as musicians. You know what I mean? That's, that's what I'm going for. I I understand that playing this type of music that, that I love and that kind of comes out of me, I'm never going to make any money. I'm never going to be rich. I'm never going to be famous. And I don't care about that. What I want is to earn the respect of the players that I really look up to. And to me, that's the satisfaction part. And so for whatever reason, that's what kind of keeps me chasing that dragon or whatever, you know? Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, as far as I'm assuming you write all your own lyrics and everything too, then. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it. I mean, I do, I do some, uh, it's kind of a it's kind of a complicated question actually. I I do write a lot of stuff and I I perform a lot of my own music, but I think that it's also important in the tradition of this style of music that I do some traditional songs. You know what I mean? Because it's it's always kind of been an oral tradition to pass on, and so part of my job as a blues musician or a roots musician is to pass some of this stuff on. So if I play a set, you know, if I'm playing a night of music three or four hours of music probably half of that is my own stuff and half of it is traditional music oh wow that's that's crazy uh is your album tired and dirty is that all originals or do you got any covers that's all on original it? yeah that's the last two my last two solo records that i've recorded have all been original music and the fact that the the reason that i do that honestly is um i've gotten tired of paying to use other people's music i mean in my first first couple records there was definitely some whatever you want to call them cover songs or whatever of traditional music and you got to pay royalties and you got to pay rights for that and i'm cheap and i'm trying to maximize my you know profits for lack of a better term not that there is any but you know trying to keep my overhead low yes and uh, so i just figured that i'm going to start recall record my own music and when i have enough material i'll make a new record and if i don't have enough new material i just won't make a new record i mean there's no i'm an independent musician so fortunate or for better or for worse there's no record label that i report to in terms of output you know if it mm-hmm. if it takes two years or if it takes a year if it takes five years it, it, a new record comes out when it's ready i guess you know yeah that makes sense yeah i was i was thinking about the lyrical content in some of these songs um i believe the song uh, oh gosh now i'm drawing a blank on what song it was you'll know for sure uh the dirtier the hands the cleaner the money was one of the lyrics i heard in in your album and that yeah, yeah. that's the t- that's from i think the song is called tired and dirty Hell, i don't remember you have to look at the back of the album or something <laughs> but yeah i think that's from tired and dirty yeah uh yes yes yeah but yeah dude i mean like some of the things and some of the songs were so profound like i said i even wrote that one down because that was that's such a uh I mean, it's it's a very deep rooted. Uh, ask yourself the honest questions of a hard day's work kind of um, person versus self questions. You know, it's it's so introspective. I guess would be a good way to say it. Well, I appreciate you noticing that. I I kind of just write about what I know. I have a. I mean, I live a rural lifestyle and I work in agriculture outside of music, and so um, that's just kind of. I just like I said, I just kind of write about what I know and some observations that I make along the way. And, um, I'm pretty insecure about my songwriting. I never really wanted to be a songwriter. It's not something that 
really interests me. I've got friends that are singer songwriters, like guys like Chad Elliott and Ryan Doty and uh, Jordan Messerol are great Iowa songwriters. Mm-hmm. Greg Brown, Bo Ramsey, people like that. That they're real songwriters. I always just wanted to be a guitar player. I, I didn't, you know, that's what really kind of gets me going is playing guitar. Yeah. Um, the singing and the songwriting and the band leading and the business management part of it. That's all just, I just do that because you almost have, you just have to, you yeah. know, and I have to do that to be relevant and to kind of survive, like again, quote unquote, survive in the, in the industry. But all I, all I ever wanted to be was a guitar player. So I'm glad that, I'm glad that any lyrics that I write end up meaning something. Oh yeah, well they they definitely do. I mean, you can tell that you're you're humble about this. Uh, but like, what I I get what you're saying. You wanted to be a guitarist first and maybe a songwriter second because you looked up to so many songwriters. Um, what what got you over that barrier of actually writing your own music and and doing that instead of actually just sitting back and being like, I don't know, I've written some songs. They're just kind of on a laptop somewhere. I don't let anybody hear them or whatever. What what got you over that barrier and actually? made you record well, like, something yeah like i said i, I really I, I it sounds bad but i don't have an, any interest in writing songs but i do a, i do it because i have to have an output you know I, I make myself do it because um i need to produce music to be sort of relevant and to be to find my little niche and things like that as a guitar player you know even if you're a great guitar player there's a million other great guitar players and if you want to work you better figure out a way to make yourself more valuable, so to speak. Right. I mean, if I, yeah. it's just hard to find jobs as a guitar player. That's why I end up, I end up front in my own band. It's like, I don't have a desire to be a band leader or to be a lead singer or a front man or anything like that. I'd be more than happy just backing somebody up on guitar for the rest of my life, but I won't ever work. You know what I mean? It's like, I won't, I won't have gigs or as many as I want. Mm-hmm. So it's just a matter of wanting to work a lot that you, that I've, sort of made myself do this stuff it's like if you want to look good at the beach you got to eat right and go to the gym you know what yeah, I mean? yeah 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 if i want to if i want to work i need to write songs yeah and i need i need to make albums and i need to make albums of original music otherwise i feel like i, I just wouldn't be able to stay as busy as i like to stay musically so yeah i mean that it's, totally- simple. It's, that, it's that simple man i'm super like practical and pragmatic to a fault it drives my wife crazy but it's, it's, <laughs> it's Sim- simply that like I do it to be productive and to produce a product uh, that totally makes sense I mean I was I was kind of raised on uh, the moniker of sometimes you just do the work because the work needs to be done uh, that's not, not necessarily because you do any do it because it gives you any joy or has any monetary output or or something it's just sometimes work needs to be done I'm kind of like you I grew up on a farm um, so a real rural area uh, but you know maybe that's just part of the upbringing maybe that's a little bit of Iowa too though a little bit of Absolutely. Iowa that's in yeah. all of us yeah for better or for worse you know like I said it's like uh, there, there's definitely I was raised with that attitude also and and uh, you know nobody said that this stuff was gonna be fun all the time you know nothing it's like I hate to make another you know analogy, but it's like that's why we don't eat pancakes for every meal because you know it's not every every meal isn't supposed to be delicious. You know, it's like you've, you're eating to feed yourself. That's so, true. That's yeah, very work, true. work's not always fun. Most of the time, it's not. Um, honestly, I hate, I don't want to sound like a bummer, but it's like you know seventy percent of the stuff that I do for music it kind of sucks. You know, it's like there's a lot of driving. Yep. Uh, a lot of playing for people that aren't listening in loud rooms, you know, and, mm-hmm. and I do that because that's the job and that's the work that needs to be done in order to reach my goals. That's what you have to do. You yeah. Know? Yeah, so, definitely. I mean, simple as that. I mean, that's another one, at least for exposure and stuff like that. If you go to, if you go to play in a room where some people aren't necessarily paying attention, it's just the fact that you were there and you played and people enjoyed it, uh, that got your name out there. And that's, it's part of that exposure thing, you know, and, and like you said, if you hadn't written your own original songs, then you wouldn't be able to play original music when you show up places. And, um, I, I totally get it. Cause there's something that comes with, uh, doing the work and, and putting it in there and writing the original songs. I just, uh, I don't know. I, I still have this weird self-conscious thing about me where I don't ever want to let any of my original music out because I'm just, uh, I don't know. I just, I'm just weirded out by what people will think about oh, it, yeah. I guess. It's, br- it's brutal, man. I hate it. Honestly, like I, it, I understand exactly what you're saying. I, I, 
am wildly uncomfortable performing my own music. I think and it's just, no matter it's how a, much I even just performing live, I still have anxiety just because I'm not super comfortable being the center of attention. Yeah. Again, it's just like something. It's a means to an end. You know, it's it's what I have to do to reach my goals. And so that's kind of the way you have to look at it. I'm I'm not comfortable. I know a lot of people that are super confident in what they do and they're anxious to share this stuff with the world or whatever. And I'm just not that way. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but you know, I think a lot of this all, uh, describes the music and all this stuff just kind of fits together. Cause it's, uh, it's all comes from a humble place and you, you can totally tell that, um, whether or not you're, like I said, you're online, you're playing music for people and just kind of talking to whoever's chiming in watching you live, or you're giving away some of the secrets or the lyrical content of your music or, or just the way you describe all this, you know, it, it totally makes sense that all the pieces fit together and uh, I totally understand it. So I hope, I hope everybody else like kind of gets these analogies too, though, because not, like you said, not everybody that's out there playing music for some reason or another, not everyone that's playing music wants to be like the absolute center of attention and be like carried off uh, on everyone's shoulders when the night's over, you know? Yeah, no, I, I roll my eyes pretty hard at the thought of that. You know, I, do, <laughs> I do know, I do know people like that. And it's like that kind of, I, you know, like I said, I get pretty eye rolly about that whole thing, but, um, yeah, I don't know. And maybe that's just not who I am, but that's maybe who somebody else is. And, and I think the most important part in all of this is you do kind of have to be yourself, you know, I mean, I, again, for better or for worse, maybe it'll, maybe it holds me back or whatever, but it's like, I, I'm not interested in, chasing somebody else's idea of what a performer should be or what a musician should be or a guitar player should be or whatever. Like I just, I can't waste my time with that. I just, I want to be the best version of myself, you know, and yeah. that, that applies to pretty much every aspect of life. Yeah. I feel like everybody can easily tell if you're coming in genuine, uh, almost no matter what you're doing. I mean, think of, uh, your everyday life with your coworkers. Uh, everybody's had a job with somebody that like hated coming into work every day, you know? So like, uh, it's something kind of like that. As long as, as long as they're not trying to live out someone else's dream, you know, the same thing goes for any performer. If you're just doing what you're doing, um, people will see the genuineness in your personality kind of come through. And that's all people are really looking for. Well, I hope so. I hope so. I hope you're right. I, I get a little jaded about that sometimes. It, it feels like music and any kind of, well, even a lot of different art art forms and and things like that it's like there's a lot of bullshit that people tend to eat up oh you know yeah I mean? and and it seems like there's a lot of people that are being something other than what they truly are and they're successful at it and so you kind of end up chasing your own tail or whatever but it seems i guess my point is i feel like music is one of those you know uh, areas that kind of rewards people for that sort of bullshit. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. people eat up, eat up the people with the cool jackets and the cool haircuts and all that stuff. Even if the substance isn't, you know, even if the substance isn't there, like I could care less about the sizzle, man. I'm just all about the steak, you know? And Ooh, I, yeah. I listen the things that I listen to are a hundred percent. And the people that I respect are a hundred percent like that. Yeah. And I totally get what you're saying. It's the music industry, just cookie cuttering. They found one band, like it's a uh, Nirvana's good. All right. Just cookie cut everything after Nirvana and yeah. boom, you got <laughs> grunge music, you know, and it was no different than eighties and hair metal. It was no different than seventies uh, and your rock and roll Led Zeppelins and deep purples. I mean, um, it just, it just happens in every generation. And like you said, music, music industry is really good for that. You're talking mm -hmm. about people chasing after, Oh, I like the guy with the awesome jacket or the, the cool hair. And I mean, the older I get, the more I like anybody with any hair because I'm, I'm just jealous oh, yeah, of it. Too. I'm in the same boat, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get my hat game on point. <laughs> yeah. So how did you transfer from being a 20-year-old that's just picking this up, um, I guess a 20-ish year old that's just picking this up, to who you are now? I mean, you had did you take lessons from somebody? Did you did you know this was the style you were gunning for at first or, or did you don some spandex and start shredding some leads in a in a cover band yeah. somewhere. Uh, no, my story is not that interesting. Um, I kind of, uh, you know, like I said, I picked it up and within, oh geez, within probably like, this sounds silly, but within six to eight weeks of, of picking up guitar, I heard, um, I heard a Sun House record and I heard Sun House play Death Letter Blues and from that moment on, that's all I cared about. And, uh, probably within again within a couple months of picking up guitar i started gigging and i haven't stopped since then and literally that path of constant gigging for all those years has 
developed into what what it is now yeah and hopefully 20 more years down the line it'll you know keep developing but um it was that simple i never really did anything else that within a few months a couple months of here you know starting to play i heard sun house and that that kind of music and and that american roots music is all i all i was ever interested in that's cool i uh i wrote that down i'm definitely gonna check it out i uh, suggest everyone else check it out that's one of the coolest parts about this is kind of finding certain bands and people and and whether or not they're area musicians or somewhat local everybody's always got a handful of bands that they're like oh i I really like these guys and they kind of influenced me a little bit and uh you know so I'm, i'm writing that down i'm gonna check it out uh seems like every couple of podcasts i get some recommendations like that and i'm uh I'm gonna definitely check that out. I I noticed you do like a, a Telecaster Tuesday thing. Uh, is that on your uh, Facebook? Does that sound right? Yeah, probably Instagram, and then shares the Facebook or whatever. But yeah, I'm a big. Uh, I love Telecasters. So um, yeah, just I mean, I just love looking at pictures of Telecasters and you know all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I share that share that whenever I can. Are those uh, all Telecasters you just like, or ones that you've owned uh, either now or in the past, or? Yeah, I usually, I'm usually usually anything I post is of my own is my own yeah stuff. I, uh, I I really dig on the Telecasters. I recall even seeing one, and this is you're gonna have to help me on this too. Uh, the Telecaster that only has one pickup that they made before. Yeah, an Esquire. It's an Esquire. That's the uh, that's my number one guitar with any kind of. Obviously, when I'm playing solo, I play solo, and then I play with with bands, and and it's kind of a different setup. You know, I use different instruments for the different setups but um for band stuff that that one pickup telecaster that esquire is my number one guitar that's the best instrument i've ever owned i remember seeing one of those for the first time and it was one of them that somebody had uh retrofitted uh a modern telecaster to look like one of those and it i mean it's the concept was still there and it was it really made me kind of think about it like wow i've never never even thought about this and then i started looking at the history of the telecaster i was like oh this is pretty much what they made when they first tested it out before they yeah. made the two the two pickup options which is kind of crazy Le- yeah leo leo got it right the first time <laughs> they're 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 magic there's something about it something about an ash body esquire with that one pickup they're magic i it, it sounds silly but i've thought about this a lot obviously and i think that there's something about that lack of the front pickup not pulling on the strings you know they're magnets mm-hmm. so it's just, there's just some subtle thing going on with that magnetic field not to get all hippy dippy but there's something going on there that they're just esquires to me are just are magic and they're surprisingly versatile i think they don't get a lot of credit i think people kind of turn away from them instantly just thinking like oh i can't do i can't do anything with one pickup but i promise you once you learn to once you learn to vary your pick attack you know, go back and forth between pick and fingers. You can learn to use your volume control and the tone control on the guitar. I can make that thing sound like a 335. You know, it's, I mean, I can, you can get all kinds of different sounds out of it. That's uh, definitely something that I am still kind of figuring out on my own. I guess the the fun part about it is I've, I like to see what kind of amp setups you have and things like that. Just, just because it, it, I don't know, the gear th- thoughts always enter- entertain me. I've always liked gear. I've always liked playing on different instruments and things like that. And I don't have too much gear of my own, but I do have a, it's like a, let's see here. I think it's a remake of a Fender Super Champ. Oh yeah. Uh, it's, it's an old style amp that just had uh, maybe that's what it is. I don't know. I'd have to look it up. I'd have to look up, but it's a PV uh, JSX like a uh, mini colossal and it's, it's just got a, a volume and a tone knob on it. And I, I was like, man, what can you do with a guitar amp that only has one channel, you know? And uh, I started to figure out, oh, if you, you know, dink with the volume, you know, turn the volume down to about seven, it cleans it up a little bit. And if you turn it down a little bit more, you get even cleaner. And you start to really kind of figure those things out. Um, I I mean, when I first started playing guitar, it was like high gain all the time. Uh, Everything's got to be as distorted as possible. You know, (laughs) I was one of those kids growing up. So like to, to start leaning in the blues direction as an adult, and start playing with uh, cleaner amps and lower gain possibilities. It was, it was really kind of an eye opener for me to realize that uh, a lot of the guys back in the day, you know, I'd say back in the day, but with amps that didn't have high gain and only one channel, they were really doing quite a bit of stuff. Um, maybe with just a pedal or two and and a guitar for the most part. Yeah, it really really teaches you how to play your instrument. I mean, to to literally 
get what you can out of you know how to ha- how to handle that thing you know because if you're if you're playing kind of full out all the time you know high gain whatever there's not a lot of subtlety right mm-hmm. but you're you know playing this style of music with a minimal setup you're really forced to sort of use your I don't know what the proper term is but you you know got to use your wits you yeah gotta, you, you got to figure out how to play the thing to get the sounds that you want and yeah there's I mean all the people that I loved, you know, the, what do you call it? Yeah. The old timers or whatever. It's like you plug a, plug a Telecaster or a Les Paul into a Fender tweed amp with some reverb and you turn the amp all the way up and then you use your volume control on your guitar to get dirty or clean sounds and you vary your pick attack and you, you just, you, you actually play the instrument, you know? Yeah. So, so that really, it really teaches you how to do that for sure. Yeah. I mean, that was something that I, I'd always known that was a thing that was, something people were doing you know but i just i never sat down on my own time and 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 really dinked with it a whole lot until uh it sounds crazy but as uh, the coronavirus thing has kind of locked everyone down i my hobby that i tried to pick up was uh using a single channel amp with a just a strat to try to figure out exactly what's going on with all the different tones that i can yeah. pull out of it and it's been really fun you know uh, dealing with low gain and clean sounds you actually get to really hear the attack of the picks and uh the difference in the pickups comes through a lot better etc cetera, etc cetera. I'm, I'm sure i'm saying stuff a lot of guitarists are just rolling their eyes out like yeah i've known this forever you know but uh it's it's fun to be able to sit down and, and figure that kind of stuff out i i never really put too much stock into it i always just leaned on pedals for the most part but uh yeah, I mean, I is that something like the quest for tone, I guess, the the search for the best sounding thing that you like that defines your sound. Is that something that you've always kind of hunted down or did you just kind of buy a couple amps and stick with it? Yeah, I, I started out real minimal and then you know, in recent years I've actually tried to branch out a little bit more and get get a little bit more of the handle on the gear aspect and that's kind of become a hobby for me. The gear has become a hobby and the playing is sort of the the passion is kind of how I, how I describe it, but I like messing around with different things and trying to find, you know, the, the trick is really finding a tone or a setup that makes you play your best and makes you play as inspired as you can be. You know what I mean? And, and yeah. whether or not it sounds good to somebody else again, like I, I don't worry about that. I, I try to figure out something that makes me be my best, you know? And, uh, but at the same time, you know, that's, that's what you, you know, for live performances, I want to, I want to put something out at my best. So I want to dial something in that makes me play my best. But at home practicing, I either practice without an amp completely, an unplugged guitar or as clean as I can get, you know, just a black face fender, the little reverb, low volume. And because there's nowhere to hide, there's nowhere to hide from that. Yeah. You know, you're, your technique and your sort of command over what you're doing has to be spot on. Otherwise it's going to sound like garbage. There's just nothing to hide behind. So for me, practicing like that is kind of like, uh, you know, just how I can get the most out of, out of my practice and, and figuring out my technique and all that. And the feel, you have to focus on feel a lot more cause there's no, no effects to hide behind, you know? Yeah. I mean, that totally makes sense. I, <laughs> As far as hiding behind effects, that's that's exactly what it is. I mean, you can stack distortion and delay and reverb and and a chorus and an overdrive and and a booster pedal and 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 start wahing away, and it really doesn't matter what you're playing. They're all just pretty much mistake eliminators at some point yeah. in time, you know. Yeah, but yeah, I remember a- actually remember the first time I went into a, a guitar shop and and uh, a buddy of mine was working there, and he had me check out this high gain amp. I think it was a. a I think it was a Buddha Buddha brand amps, which I think actually now PV owns, but they they made some really high gain stuff and and he had me check it out and I don't know if I had a Telecaster or a Strat or what and I plugged it in there and he cranked up the gain or whatever and I thought it was I couldn't believe how easy it was to do you know what I mean just like I barely had to play the thing where I was just so used to working so it working so hard and to squeeze everything out so 
yeah, it kind of kind of shows you just sort of makes things easier, you know. Yeah, it really does. It uh, it smooths everything out and just makes it really kind of feel. Not that there's there's an art form to all of this, and everybody has their own preferences. But that was always one of the funniest jokes when I would see guitar memes come across. Um, people would like label guitar pedals as different things, and like, uh, was it the Kirk Hammett mistake eliminator was yeah. what the wah pedal was or something. That's great. Yeah. But, but you know, I, I don't know. I'm not poking fun at anybody. I'm not the best musician, anyways. So like, I'm I'm just well, yeah. Me I, neither, man. I mean, I'm not I'm not mad at anybody for doing what they do. Don't get me wrong. But yeah, well, that's the thing, though. I think once you start learning guitar and you start learning a couple different styles, or you start to f- try to figure out how to incorporate what other people are doing into what you're doing, almost nothing's off limits at that point because you're just like. I, it's, I've said it before on the podcast. I'll go to a show and it'll be a band playing music that I don't necessarily prefer, but the people up there are playing music that I can't play. I don't know how to do what they're doing, and they're doing crazy stuff, you know? And it, that's what makes it really entertaining to me is the fact that everyone's out there doing their own thing. And, you know, whether it comes down to dudes, you know, shredding solos or people coming up with a lick that I could, you know, I didn't think of while I was sitting in my basement at home alone, you know, it's, that's, that's really where it's all at. That's some of the coolest stuff you can, you can do. Do you ever find yourself borrowing from other genres of music and kind of incorporating it towards the root style that you play? Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, I do. It's all, it's all pretty roots based. I mean, I'm, I'm probably not going to take a, you know, metal run or something like that, but but I'll definitely take some like more country style things and try to incorporate it into a straight blues format, you know, or, or whatever um, techniques to get different sounds and things like that. So yeah, we all, you know, that's kind of the, that's kind of the beauty of this thing is the ability to just draw off of all these different influences to kind of, like you mentioned, kind of come up with your own voice um, by pulling from all this different stuff. Yeah. Everything's fair game. Really. There's no, there's no rules to this thing, you know. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Uh, I mean, go to any live show; um, it's it's ever apparent because uh, there's so much music out there and people playing so many different styles. Um, and the fact that you play a style that is it's in Iowa, it's relatively uh, open. You know, there's not too many people playing music that is the same style as you. I mean, I, I mean, as far as I can tell, um, around the area, you you've got a nice mix of, like you said. Um, roots music and it leans a little bit towards bluesy stuff you play the dobro a lot right mm-hmm. yeah for my so for like the solo stuff i for the acoustic style, style stuff that's kind of my preferred uh avenue to go down yeah what got you into a dobro for the first time well again sun house like the you know first time i saw a video of sun house he was playing a uh national style oh uh brass bodied national steel or uh brass bodied national and uh so i've been into that ever since that's pretty cool uh i mean i've always thought they were kind of interesting guitars because they're like it's it's an acoustic guitar for people that don't know but it's it's a little bit more than that it's kind of got like a it's a metal plate on the front that's almost like a drum almost like a banjo but not it's like a, it's like a hubcap it looks like a hubcap there yeah. you go yeah and uh it that resonates to make the sound as opposed to the wood um, on the top of the guitar. Does that sound about right? Yeah, that's right. And actually, if you get if you get close up to it or in the same room with somebody that's doing that, you'll realize that they're loud as shit. I mean, compare especially compared to a flat top acoustic guitar, and they were they were designed to be that way. It's kind of an interesting history. They were invented in the early to mid 1920s and kind of were put into production in the late 1920s. To, um, I mean, this was before there was any such thing as an electric guitar or an amplifier or anything like that. And so in these big band situations, you know, you think of like a big band with a, a guitar player playing a flat top or an arch top acoustic and kind of chopping away and playing rhythm chords and comping behind these horn soloists and things like that. Mm-hmm. There's no way in a setting like that for that acoustic guitar to be heard. Like they, yeah. just, di- they just disappear. Uh, yeah, yeah. So- and so these guys had the Dopiera brothers was their name, and that's where the the, the term dobro came from. Oh, cool. uh, and invented that style of guitar, and they actually invented a tricone version of it first, which had three small cones instead of the one big cone. Okay. And and those sort of so they were they were developed for use in big band settings, and then they were kind of um, became popular among blues player you know post war blues players because at that time they were just affordable and easy to get a hold of and and they kind of lent themselves well to that 
that sound. So, yeah, and the different you can compare the difference between a single cone and a tricone, and they're totally different instruments, totally different sounds, and uh, they 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 lend themselves well to certain styles of stuff, and they've just sort of evolved like that. So there's a whole whole history about it. That's really cool, man. I'm gonna have to check check that out a little bit more. I I've, I knew a little bit about that. How they wanted a louder guitar, and uh, I remember the vi- the visual I built in my mind was like if you're watching Lawrence Welk, and there's the horns and everything's going on. There's a guy playing the guitar off to the side, but you can't yeah. hear anything about what he's doing. He's no, and you know he like he could, the thing about it is is like he couldn't even hear himself. No, and so there was there there was this demand where these guitar players were just like I need something to just hear myself over this trumpet in my ear yeah and you can watch old videos of those guys and like you said they are just hacking away at the strings trying to play as loud as they can and still play well and and probably a lot of arthritis came from that oh gosh i could only imagine but i mean that's that speaks a little bit to the you know the transfer of the guitar from being just a rhythm instrument to being an instrument that sits out front too though um absolutely that's i mean that's you know, part of one of the early stepping stones of that. And then, then somebody put a pickup in an archtop guitar, you know, a big archtop Gibson or something like that. And then you've got Charles Christian playing lead guitar for the first time, you know, blowing people's minds as you could imagine in the forties or whatever. And yeah. Um, yeah, that's kind of all where, all where it came from. That's really cool. You know, uh, I, I, I guess I, I knew some of this about the Dobro, but I wasn't super, wasn't super sure. And it's really cool to have, you know, like you around here. You're not just somebody who picked up a guitar and was like, I don't know, I like this thing. You're actually interested in the history of it all, which I guess once again lends itself really well to your, your playing style and, and your style of music that comes out. Yeah. I, uh, it's fun. Yeah. I mean, I... I wish I had the dedication that you do to to do some of the things you're doing because I feel like it would take it would take a lot of dedication. I mean, that seems to be the common factor that a lot of people have uh, coming in the podcast when I ask, like, how did you get so good? And it's like you said earlier, it, it took a lot of time. It wasn't like you were just picking the guitar up for five minutes a day and calling it good. You were spending hours and hours at a, at a time uh, for part of your 20s playing the guitar just playing the guitar and getting better and finding your own voice yeah it's just like i said it's just a matter of i mean that's what yeah anybody who's good at anything you know whether it's woodworking or uh i don't know scrapbooking or whatever the people that are really good at it they put a lot of time into it and they make it like i said mentioned kind of alluded to earlier they made it a priority in their lives you know and and you know you can make somebody can make a priority of watching Netflix all day or whatever. And that's fine if that's what you want to do. But, uh, you know, I'd rather think about guitar playing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No kidding. I mean, I'm guilty as charged just as everyone else is of probably watching a little too much streaming television, but, uh, <laughs> well now, yeah, nowadays it's hard to, hard to not do that. Yeah. You just got to peel yourself away and go, go clean your lawn or something. You got to do, do anything productive. (laughs) Hey, speaking of that, actually, I was cleaning today and I found one, when I first started the podcast up, I made a list and it was uh, a giant page of all these people that I wanted to have on the podcast and your name's in there. Oh, great. Yeah. Like, so so I've, I've known about you playing guitar for, uh, well, at least a year and a half now. So that's really kind of cool to like, I peeled this baby out and I, I had it set over in the corner and kind of forgot about it until now. But yeah, I was cleaning today and I, I found this list of all these people that I wanted on the podcast and most of them are, I've, I've kind of knocked through, but yeah, it's kind of crazy. You're, you were on that list from the get go. Well, I'm glad I'm, I'm happy to hear that and I'm glad we're finally making it happen. Yeah. Uh, you were talking earlier about playing Telecaster in a band do you play with other people in their bands uh, on occasion or do you just bust yeah. the Telecaster out live doing solo stuff sometimes? Um, mostly, like I said, the Telecaster is mo- mostly designed for, or, you know, kind of suits uh, the style of what I'm playing in, in bands. And I have, I have my own band and then I play with, um, oh geez, probably uh, four or five other bands just as a sort of, just as a guitar player, I don't, I don't do a lot of the singing. Obviously with my own band, I front the band and I sing all the songs and whatever. And then with these other bands, I'm just kind of the, uh, a supporting musician, just kind of a guitar player. And, uh, then I'll do, I'll do some gigs where I'm backing up like, um, a singer songwriter type person in like a duo setting or a small, real small combo setting. And so, yeah, you're kind of, uh, and I did. I sort of do the, do this on purpose. I want to be a well well rounded guitar player, and so I try to put myself self into situations where I'm 
having to stretch or learn or be out of my comfort zone and things like that. So yeah, I just, I try to put myself in a lot of different musical situations. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's nothing better than putting yourself outside of your comfort zone to learn. Um, that's once again, goes any aspect in life, not just, not just music, but, uh, uh, that comes back to, I mean, I played one solo show live and, and that was when I realized there's like you were talking earlier when you're playing clean music, uh, clean guitar, or acoustic guitar, there's not really anywhere to hide behind any effects or anything that's going on. And that's when I kind of realized that, but that was also some of the most fun because I, I, I'm not a singer songwriter. I'm not a, not even really that good of a singer to be honest, but I, I, I went, I got hired for a gig and I went and did the gig and played a couple hours and it was you know stepping outside my comfort zone was probably some of the most fun i had because i i currently play in a punk band and in a metal band so like i mean playing acoustic guitar and uh you know playing can't you see or you know whatever you know playing cover songs for the most part it's it's not really my wheelhouse so it was but it was tons of fun it was great learning experience and i you know i learned what i can do and what i can't do next time if there is a next time and uh, I mean, what are some of the other times you spent stepping outside of your comfort zone to, to get better uh, at guitar? Did you, uh, as far as like maybe traveling or playing shows in, in new venues or or things like that? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I feel like if you're not scared to death, you're probably doing something wrong. You know, I mean, you're, <laughs> or you're not you're not stretching, you're not pushing yourself as a musician and that's the only way to get better, honestly. Um, so I've always tried to put myself in situations where I'm at least a little bit uncomfortable. Like I said, if it, if it gets too comfortable, you're not, you're sort of cheating yourself, you know? Um, fortunately I, I've, I kind of started out when I first started out, I was doing solo stuff and then I started playing with a band and then I started playing with other bands and I kind of, was playing mostly with bands and then I had to get get back into playing solo stuff when some of that work dried up. Like I said, I've always just I always want to work a lot and play as much as I can. Um I this year is going to be tough with you know having basically two two months worth of gigs canceled and va- evaporating into air, but since 2002 I haven't played less than 100 shows in one year. I mean, I do Woo. I do between 100 and 150 every year for the last, you know, almost 20 years so uh, in order to stay that busy you have to be put yourself in those those different situations and and try to stretch so uh, again it's and it, it's good for me to to try to try to do that because from a solo musician standpoint performing that way you have to approach your instrument totally differently it's like yes it's a guitar, it's still a guitar but your approach to it and the way i play it is totally different for example in a solo setting i use my fingers i play with my fingers or finger picks technically but um, i play a finger style guitar because i'm i have to cover the bass parts and the melody parts at the same time mm-hmm. to fill that space but in a band setting i use a flat pick i play more of a you know what you would think of like a lead guitar style and things like that so um, being in those different situations, it's a different part of your brain and that you sort of have to exercise. So, um, it forces you to approach your instrument differently in those situations. And to me, it makes me a more well-rounded musician. And I can take, I can take parts of each of those situations and apply it to the other one. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like I, playing as a solo act has really got my sense of timing and groove really tight and i can apply that to a band setting and it translates well you know or, yeah. or vice versa so yeah. i don't know i guess i kind of i kind of i don't know if it was a conscious thought but i just always found myself in those situations of different styles and different settings and things like that and i i realized eventually that oh this is this is the whole point you know and so now i try to make sure that's happening uh I, I love what you said about playing solo. You kind of have more space to fill up. You have to play the the bass and the I don't want to call it the lead, but I don't know the bass and the trebly part. Like the the melody is going to get played on the higher strings for the most part, and the bass play you know is going to get played on the lower strings for the most part. And uh, that's that was one of the first things I noticed in in your album was the the finger picking and the ability for you to. Uh, I remember reading a Stevie Ray Vaughan um, article once, and he's got this style that 
uh, it feels like the drums are playing with him, even if there's no drums playing, because when he plays alone, there's no drums playing. So he's got to find a way to make what he's playing more percussive as if there were drums. So yeah. uh, you, get, you end up with stuff like that. And he ends up uh, with this style that uh, melds the two together. And that's not much different than what you're doing, where you're melding the bass line and the guitar line all together into one guitar. And you can you can easily hear it if you listen to any of the songs that you've got on uh, the Tired and Dirty album that's available for streaming on streaming services. And, you know, that's really cool. What what? How did you get into finger picking? Because it's always escaped me i've i've watched so many videos on it and it's like i i get within a grasp and then it's just like i don't know i don't i guess i can't figure out what's going on here yeah that was that was one avenue that i really kind of sought out some help for when i first when i first got into that which was relatively early on in my playing um i was kind of kind of messing around with it and only getting so far and there's a great player finger style player in des moines named rob lombard who is a master of that style um of a that sort of um well i don't know what how you describe it piedmont style blues or country blues or almost like a jazz blues kind of fusion of finger style guitar playing and so i actually sought him out um i think i i think i actually uh at that time i looked his name up in the phone book and called him, you know, called him on <laughs> the phone in my kitchen, you know, and uh, that's awesome. Basically, just said, um, you know, yeah, Mr. Lombard, I'm interested in, you know, because everybody, everybody knew in the area knew that he was the guy, as far as that's concerned. I mean, liter- you know, literally a master, world class player. And um, I said, you know, w- would you be willing to show me some stuff? And he, you know, in true true Rob Lombard fashion, we've gotten to be good, really good friends over the year. He just said. I think his reply was, sure, come on over. And uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so we just went over and I, I sat down with him quite a bit over the years to sort of pick up little things here and there. And then beyond that, it was just a whole bunch of time learning to, uh, the trick is you, you kind of have to think of it like you're a piano player. You know, you're, you're left, instead of your left hand versus your right hand doing two different things, it's your thumb versus the rest of your fingers doing two different things. And you, and if you focus on learning bass parts and then adding melody parts, you sort of train those two parts of your hand to work independently. Ah. You know? Well, man, I maybe I need to hit them up. No, just, just yeah. yeah. No, I, dude, and that's the other crazy thing. I've I've always dug that. I don't feel like it's something that translates well to the modern guitar. You don't see too many guys doing the finger picking style. A lot of guys like. Um, like you said, when you play your solo stuff, it's a lot of flat pick type stuff. Um, and that's what for the novice or anybody that's just listening to this off, off the fly. That's what ever, it seems like, I mean, you could just say everyone plays the finger or uh, the, the flat pick style. And there's, you kind of have to hunt down people to play the finger pick style. And I mean, that's, that's really honestly how it all started with like classical guitar and things like that. Um, yeah. Any, uh, any type of, any type of music that was performed by a limited number of people and you you know you're forced to fill up the space harmonically if it makes sense you know you're forced to to make one instrument sound like a full band in order to to get people's attention and to sort of fill that sonic space yeah yeah i mean that's that's what a lot of it is is it came out of out of necessity which is kind of the cool part about it i feel like a lot of music uh evolves like that just literally based on necessity i mean or what's available and and or what's not available and how can we work around it to to get what we still want Mm -hmm. yeah and yeah definitely i mean if you listen to guys like um charlie Patton or sunhouse or robert johnson or uh, john hurt i mean there it's just a, a one guy on a guitar and it sounds like to me it sounds like an orchestra and that 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 fascinated me from from the very beginning, just like how they, it's one of the first things I latched onto is how does one person fill up so much space? And a lot of it is being able to play, you know, the bass part and the, 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 like you said, the treble part at the same, same time. But also just like in a band setting, if that group, if the groove isn't right, everything falls apart. I mean, that's what gets people locked in and makes people understand what's happening. I could play a wrong note, a wrong melody note and nobody notices if i drop the groove the whole a whole the whole restaurant you know it's like the record scratches and everybody turns around and looks at me yeah you know? yeah <laughs> and i think that 
a lot of people and whether it's modern music or just the way life is now, it's like the subtlety of the groove people don't tend to pick up on. I mean, I'm saying that people listening pick up on it subconsciously, but when you're learning your instrument, practicing and learning how to, how to work on that groove is the, is the thing that escapes a lot of people, I think. And to me, that groove is the only thing that matters. I mean, that's, that's the number one thing. Everything else is just like, uh, you know, toppings. It's just kind of like, that's, everything else is just gravy or, you know, whatever, but the groove is the meat. Yeah. I mean, it really is. Uh, in, in the album that I was streaming earlier today, you can totally tell that you've got that groove. One of the, one of my favorite parts about the album is you can feel it kind of breathe a little bit as you're playing. Um, when parts kind of, I, I don't know the right way to say it other than to breathe. It's, it's things, uh, slow down and speed up just a tiny bit when they absolutely, it feels like they fit so perfectly when they do that, you know, uh, like you're leaving somebody hanging and then you come right back into it. It's uh, some of my favorite favorite parts of the album there was to, like I said, kind of feel the tempo breathe to, for the parts that needed it. Um, the slower parts uh, were, you know, a little bit more somber. And then when you got back into the groove of things, it kind of starts to, the tempo starts to pick back up. And I, I feel like that's something that's really cool that lends itself to the the solo person, especially like the root style of playing where... Uh, you have the ability to um, mess around a little bit more with uh, the tempo as opposed to just being like locked into a metronome at all times and never varying from it. Yeah, once you, I mean, that's kind of a, a the way the style is. It's it's a you know it's kind of it's it can be used for like dynamic uh, dynamic range, you know, and to sort of have a little push and pull. Once you get real comfortable with the groove, you can kind of mess with that a little bit to yeah, like you said, get your get your point across, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, as from like playing in the pocket to going right back to right on the note. Uh, uh, I talked about it in a couple other podcasts with drummers, but they it kind of makes the music feel like you're either leaning forward to go somewhere or kind of just like leaning backwards and kind of just slow walking somewhere. You know, you, you get that nice little feel of that going on uh, if you just close your eyes and listen to it. It's kind of cool. You know, it's uh, it brings a lot of uh, personality, a lot of human aspects out in the music, which is, is really neat. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's feel or soul or groove, yeah, groove, whatever. Yeah, that's just that's part of the human aspect of it. Yeah, and that's what makes all this all this type of, all the type of music I love. That's what makes it great. Whether it's traditional blues or even like early R and B stuff, they all had that sort of um, dynamic, you know, dynamic changes and things like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, now that you mention it, you can actually the farther back you go in in rap, the you can actually kind of feel a little bit of it coming out with all the beats that they would they would put out. Yeah. Where it's 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 all on the notes, all on the note, and then all of a sudden it's like here's a little breakdown, and then back to the note again. That we're here's the groove we were all hitting a second. You know, it's like you bob your head, you bob your head, and then you just you let it hang for a second, and then you're right back into it. You know, and it, that's that cool feeling that. It, uh, it's almost like going over a big bump in a car. You're like, whoa, what was that? You know, it's it's really neat. It's, I mean, that's a for, that's a formula that's worked, you know, since the beginning of humankind, since they started banging pots and pans together. You know, it's just <laughs> that's what, yeah, the, the that's all very very well thought out. You know, they they do that because it works. You know, there's a reason for it. Yeah, I I also dig what you're saying about like finding the groove and keeping the groove and. Um, you know, there's a big difference between playing all the different styles. Like I was talking earlier, I play in a punk band, and that's uh, lean forward and run fast kind of music. You know, <laughs> everything's everything's crisp and on the on the one, two, three, four. There's not really much like swinging of your head that goes along with it. You know, uh, yeah. Um, but then when I like when I play alone, I play a lot more blues music, and I was I've been getting into a lot of guys that do like to keep the groove of ka chunk a duck ka chunk a duck ka chunk a duck you know it makes you really want to nod your head to the first beat and you're not playing the hide the one of of the of the thing and uh getting into that kind of a groove to uh bob your head on the one every single time with like an upbeat or something like that it's, it's weird at first but once you get into the groove you're like oh this is this is neat and it's almost it's, it's hard to fall out of the groove but if you do you're like oh geez this is this is uh, we're train wrecking here in a hurry, you know. Yeah, and no, that's yeah, that's the con. Yeah, it's hard to explain that concept of swing. I mean, that's what it is. It's what something swings. It's hard to hard to explain that or or to put put it on you know pen and paper. But that's yeah, that's what that is. I mean, and to me, that's you know that's music. That's that's the idea. You know what I mean? Yeah, 
Oh, man, I we've got a little over an hour already recorded. Uh, is there anything that uh, we haven't covered that you think we should cover in here? Because I feel like we've we've covered quite a bit of stuff. Yeah, I mean, I don't have any real pressing issues to discuss. You know, I'm happy to answer and talk about whatever you want to know. So I guess it's it's up to you. Well, I'll tell you what. This seems like a good spot to leave them wanting more. I definitely highly suggest everybody check out Matt Woods Roots Music on Facebook. Otherwise, you do have mattwoodsmusic.com still, correct? Yeah, mattwoodsmusic.com is my website with uh, pretty much everything you would want to know and probably more. And then my, I also have uh, Matt Woods Roots Music on Instagram also that I keep up with. So Yeah, I mean, uh, I found uh, from your website, I found the YouTube channel, the SoundCloud. I mean, I found it, found it all. So uh, if, if all else fails, mattwoodsmusic.com. You can find everything you need to find about Matt there. Uh, I'm going to post links to this down below uh, in the description section. Matt, don't go away. Uh, I'm going to talk to you after I end the recording. But thank you so much for sitting down and talking with me. Uh, It's been great to get to know you a little bit, man. Yeah, likewise. I appreciate you having me, and thank you to anyone that happens to be listening to this. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, man. Dude. Great episode. Uh, I had a freaking blast sitting down talking with Matt. Uh, the guy is super good, very humble. Uh, it all, all the pieces of the puzzle on this one fit together very well. Uh, the style of music, just uh, you know, working hard from a young age, and and just wanting to fill up your time with with the things that make you happy. Uh, dude, great, great sit down talking with you, Matt. I really appreciate it. If anybody's looking for Matt Woods stuff online, it's everywhere. Go to mattwoodsmusic.com. If you don't want to p- type it in, just scroll to the description section down below. I've got a link to it right there as well as his Facebook, his Instagram, his YouTube. Uh, even you can go to his SoundCloud and find some songs that aren't available on all the streaming services as well. So check out his SoundCloud. Hey, I've got to say, um, I'm going to make it a point in 2020 when all the shows start up again to go see Matt Woods. So whoever wants to go see Matt Woods with me, let's get in the car and go. Uh, Great guitarist, great guy. uh, Humble is all get out. Tons of fun, too. Uh, You know, this this episode was really good for uh, uh, little tidbits of knowledge and little... Uh, you know, one-liners of things that I can take away from. He, he used a lot of analogies that were really easy to digest. Uh, you know, you can't eat pancakes for every meal, man. Uh, that should be a, you know, that should be a common saying for everybody. And I'm, I'm glad that I got to sit down and talk with him. He's such a fun guy, uh, very talented. And you know, we, as we find out once again, where does all the talent come from? Uh, it didn't just come out of thin air. He had to actually sit down and put the time in and work for it. So. Uh, to all the aspiring musicians out there, put some time in and work on your instruments. And to everybody out there that's listening to this, uh, hey, I hope everybody you know gets back to work as fast as possible. I hope everybody's staying safe and enjoying their time. And I'm happy that uh, Matt you know took a little time out of his busy days to sit down and talk with me. So I really appreciate it. Thank Matt. Uh, you know, it, it was really good. Like I said in the, in the beginning of this, I was pretty nervous actually to talk to Matt. He was one of the one of the first people I had on my list of people I wanted to do a podcast with, and I was uh, kind of intimidated. So <laughs> uh, I can admit that now, now that it's all over with. But Matt, uh, great time sitting down talking with you. I really appreciate it. Hey everybody, I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Make sure you go to audiblefarm.com. Check out all the Audible Farm goodies. You can listen to the podcast right from there. You can go link to anything you want to from there. Uh, It's not necessarily the best website, but it's great. It's got everything that we have available there, as well as t-shirts and hoodies. We still have some of those available. Um, I ordered new t-shirts. I haven't gone down to pick them up yet. I haven't done um, almost any traveling. If you couldn't tell there's a lot of Skype episodes that have been coming out and hey you know what Uh, if they work they work and they work all right and I hope everybody's uh, enjoying the audio quality of them I try my best I'm not a genius when it comes down to this stuff so I'm just doing my best and uh, just trying to make it as easy as possible for all the guests just call me I'll record the audio I get I'll mix it the best I can and we'll call it good and I don't think it's turning out too bad if you uh, anybody has anything they want to offer up as advice and things like that just let me know i'm trying my best here and uh, if any other podcasters are looking to uh, adjust their setup for skype hit me up i would be more than happy to uh, point you in the right direction as far as getting everything set up that way 
Uh, big thanks once again to Matt. Big thanks to everybody listening. Uh, Got to thank Couchtown Coffee for sponsoring us week in and week out. I am fueled by this stuff. It's uh, it's an everyday affair, and I love it. I love Couchtown. So go to Couchtown Coffee. Check them out. Don't forget that promo code this week is Roots. Why is it Roots? Matt Woods Roots Music, baby. So, uh, yeah. Matt, thanks. Everybody that's listening, thanks. Enjoy um, enjoy everything you can while you got it, guys. Uh, it's, it's weird times out there, but I'll tell you what. It's uh, unprecedented. We're probably not going to get this much uh abil- availability to do something new that you want to do as far as time on your hands so i hope everybody is being as productive and as positive about it as you can and uh hey i'll check you guys next week peace <laughs>